أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم السلام عليكم everybody and welcome to this session of Mizan Live this is our 42nd class on this book of Shia Imamiya doctrine Alhamdulillah um, as you, those of you who are, who are following, as you know, we made it to uh, the section of the book where uh, Ayatollah Subhani speaks about controversial issues and issues that have to do with the Shia and the Shia are known for. And sometimes people will um, will find a problem in those beliefs of the Shia. So what he's trying to do is kind of explain things a little bit, make sure that. Uh, things are not misunderstood when it comes to the Shia and their beliefs, what they believe in. I think the most important thing in fighting, um, in fighting takfirism and the takfir of each other, how to counter this idea of let me call the other out, let me vilify the other, the best way to counter that is to have knowledge of the other side, what they actually say, instead of just you know basing things off of uh, or basing things on uh, a misunderstanding that we might have regarding that person or that uh, group of people. All right, so this is Article 128, and it is titled Bada. Bada is an Arabic word. It means, literally, it means when something becomes clear. And so here in, the, uh, in this context, and in theological context or Quranic context, Bada would mean when something, when the destiny, destiny or decree of something changes. And so we have this idea in the Shi'i school. It's not just peculiar to the Shi'i school though. A lot of others believe in it as well. Ayatla Subhani, he claims that this is a unanimously accepted notion, um, more or less, meaning like he, he'll say that the scope might be different, but everyone believes in this notion of Bada. So we want to discuss what that means, see what that means, see what the problem is that some people might find in this, uh, in this uh, aqidah and belief, and see if we can uh, resolve this issue, or explain it in a way that is clarified. Alright, so he says on uh, Article 128, as I said, The divine decree as regards human destiny is of two types. A. It is a definitive and unconditional destiny which is not susceptible of any kind of alteration. Okay, so he says there's one type of destiny that you just can't change no matter what. And then there's another destiny, an open-ended and conditional destiny which in the absence of certain conditions can be altered such that another destiny will replace it. Okay, so that, that we have two types of destinies here. Or I would say two types of divine decrees. Taking this into account, let us note that all groups in Islam regard Bada as a tenet of the faith, even if not all actually use the term. Okay, we'll talk about this later. Even the term, the term Bada, some people have an issue with it. We'll talk about that towards the end of the lesson. But this quibbling over terms does not detract from the proposition itself. For what matters is the meaning of the essential content of the term and not its name. Okay, whatever you want to name it, name it that. You want to call it bada, you want to call it change in circumstances, you want to call it change in decree. Whatever you want to call it, call it. He makes a good point here. Sometimes people are fighting over the name of something, while the more important thing that they need to, to focus on is what um, the essence of that thing that they're fighting over, not the name of it. And what is for sure is that lots of times, just because of a certain name that is used, a certain title that is used for a certain notion, that is what causes problems for others to misunderstand it. Um, while if they had a better understanding of what the term is referring to, they wouldn't have such an issue. But they just zoom in on the term itself and what that signifies in their mind, and so they just go with that, and sometimes that causes problems and misunderstandings. All right. He says the reality of Bada, so he wants to talk about the essence now. He says forget about whatever it's called, we'll talk about that later. 
For now, let's discuss what this is all about. The reality of Bada is founded upon two principles. The first is that God has absolute power. It would have been good if Ayatollah Subhani had actually kind of uh, explained a little bit what Bada is, then got into two, the two principles. So I think I'll do that first. Brothers and sisters, sometimes, yes, it seems like things are moving in a certain direction, circumstances, and the situation is going to be such that this result will be yielded. A, such and such result will be yielded. Right? Sometimes, yeah, things are moving in that direction. All of a sudden, they change dramatically. And something else happens. For example, I don't know, in previous nations, yes, it would seem that punishment of God is coming. For example, the, the people of Yunus, alayhi salam, it is said that they didn't embrace faith, didn't embrace faith, didn't embrace faith until their prophet gave up on them and left. And then when they, and then when the signs of punishment were kind of coming together, and it seems like Allah is about, is about to punish them, they actually embraced the faith. And so Prophet Yunus returned to them later. We, we all know the story behind that. Anyway, things like that. I, it seems that, you know, I'm going to be actually you know, end up in a certain way and then all of a sudden things end up another way. So for example, I don't know, on Ashura, for example, someone might be against Imam Hussein and this person is doomed forever. Yes, and will probably face eternal damnation on the, in the hereafter. Yet, because of a decision they make, things change and this person becomes uh, one of the companions of Imam Hussein and may, ends up giving his life in the way of Imam Hussein and... Uh, enjoying ultimate felicity in the hereafter versus eternal damnation. So there is a bada that took place here as if. There is a change in course of destiny and fate that happened here. All right, So that's what it is. Now we'll talk about this. We need to talk about this. Because nothing seems too problematic so far about it. The thing that's problematic is they say, um, why do you believe in bada that something can change the mind of God? Or God changes his mind on something. If God is all wise, all knowledgeable, all powerful, he shouldn't have to change his mind on things. And that is what the word bada implies, they'll say. It implies a change in one's decision. Why do people change their decision, change their mind? Because they don't have um, encompassing knowledge of the situation. Or things change for them, and so circumstances change equals decision changing for a certain scenario and what to do in a certain scenario but with God none of this holds that's what they'll say none of this holds so why say that God changed his mind all right so let's talk about this he says he says there's two main points here when it comes to Bada the reality of Bada is founded upon two principles the first is that God has absolute power and authority over the whole of existence and whenever he wills, he can replace a given destiny with another one. Both types of destiny mentioned above are contained within his foreknowledge. Therefore, the first type of destiny does not in any way imply a limitation of God's power, such as would strip him of the ability to change this destiny. God, in contrast to the belief of the Jews that the hand of God is tied, has infinite power. I'll talk about all this in the expression used by the Quran. Okay, so... Assalamu alaikum sister who is saying salam sister Kishwar thanks for tuning in um, what we have here brothers and sisters is a very important point I am going to liken it and compare it to uh, something that most of us maybe have experienced as kids growing up and that's choose your own destiny books you know there's these story books that kids read um, where in that story you choose your own destiny so like you read up to a certain point, right? And then you're at a fork, you're at a crossroad. You have to make a choice as the main character of that story in book. So let's just say, for example, I don't know. I remember when I was a kid growing up, I read a Batman one. So let's say you're Batman. This book, in this book, the main character, the main hero of the story is Batman. And so Batman has to make a choice. Do I either fight the Joker right now or do I run away from him? Right? The story builds up, builds up, builds up to a point where you have to choose whether you're going to fight this character or run away from him. For example, okay, I, I, I would be a horrible story writer. I know that. I'm just, just using this as an example right now. 
Um, so what the kid does is, if they choose to fight the enemy, right, they have to go to page so and so of the book and and continue their story there, right, and they will have a, a fate in that part of the story. Or if they choose to, like for example, run away in this situation, they have to go to another page of the book, and so they have they'll follow that destiny and fate, right. So there are these books, you know, choose your your own adventure books. Some of them will say, choose your own destiny uh, with 40 destinies and fates to choose from. I want to use this as an example for what I'm talking about, for what the, we're talking about here, Ayatollah Subhani is trying to mention, about how um, this this uh, des- these different destinies, right, that one can play a role in choosing, doesn't go against God's power or God's knowledge or doesn't limit God. God has knowledge of all these destinies. It all depends on the path we take. All right, so that's what he's saying in these as we as we read and as we go on. He says it's not like how the Jews said it of the Prophet's time that the Quran mentions Yadullahi Maglula that they felt they would say that God's hands are tied. And the Qur'an gets very upset at this and says, no, no, as a matter of fact, Allah's hands are not tied. He didn't just create you and let you go and do whatever you want and then He can't have any say in the destiny and fate of people. No, no, no. بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَةً His hands are very nicely open and they can do whatever they want. He can do whatever He wants. It says, in other words, God's creativity and the actions deriving from His power are continuous and by the authority of the words, every day he is acting upon an affair. This is verse of the Quran. Kulla yawmin huwa fi sha'an. By the authority of this this verse, God has not disengaged himself from the work of creation. Rather, the process of creation is a continuous one. This is a wrong. This is this is an erroneous understanding to think that God had everything to do with creation. And then after he creates, he lets everything go and he's minding his own business somewhere else, doing something else, and the world is working like a clock. Yes, the wor- world does work like a clock, but at the same time he's at the top and everything that is happening is going through him and his permission. Okay. He says, Imam Sadiq comments السلام, as follows upon the above quoted verse wherein the Yahud claim that the hand of God is tied. Okay, so we have a verse of the Qur'an, which lets us know that the Yahud of the Prophet's time would say that, the God, that God's hands are tied. We have a hadith regarding this verse of the Qur'an, by Imam al-Sadiq, where he says, The Yahud say that God has disengaged himself from the work of creation. He has, in other words, when he created, now he put his creation aside, he doesn't care about it anymore, he has nothing to do with it. No. He has, um, they say he has nothing to do with such matters as increasing or diminishing daily sustenance, the length of life, and so on. Denying this, God has said, غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا so Imam al-Sadiq is saying, he's saying, look at the continuation of the verse. It says, غُلَّتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَلُعِنُوا بِمَا قَالُوا بَلْ يَدَاهُ مَبْسُوطَتَانِ يُنْفِقُوا كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ that no, 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 God's hands aren't tied, their hands are tied. And they are accursed for saying so. You make claims about God when you don't know what you're talking about, gets you in trouble. The Imam is saying that they got themselves in trouble for saying something that they were they knew wasn't true about Allah. Nay, his hands are spread out wide and he does whatever he needs to do. He, he bestoweth as he will. Surah Ma'idah verse 64. Then Imam al-Sadiq adds, do they not hear the words of God? Yamhullahu ma yasha'u wa yuthbit wa indahu ummul kitab. He says, look, the other verses of the Quran are telling us that uh, Allah, when it comes to His divine decree, He effaces what He wants and establishes what He wants. And with Him is the mother of the book. In other words, that uh, div- that ultimate decree and knowledge of the destiny of people it's all it all belongs to him right so anything that's going to actually happen in this world in this dunya is is recorded there and is in the la- is is within the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you can't 
you can't exclude God from any of this. Anything, any affair of this dunya, Allah will be aware of it, will be decreeing it, and so on. Alright, so the conclusion from the above points is as follows, he says. Islamic belief is based on God's infinite power. If you believe in God, you believe in His infinite power. Absolute authority and perpetual creativity. He creates, he's, he's involved in creation. God is capable at any time He so wishes of bringing about a transformation in the things destined for man, such as His lifespan or His daily bread, causing one destined thing to replace another thing previously destined. He changes one destiny to another destiny if he wants. Both things destined have been previously inscribed in the Ummul Kitab. Going back to that example that I gave about those choose your own adventure books. At the end of the day, that book encompasses all the different destinies and faith uh, and, and fates. True? Yes, in the end you're gonna take one of those paths, but knowledge of everything that can happen. And which one you are going to choose by your own free will, all of that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? But the question now is, well, you just said in the end of this section that God is the one who will replace any destiny with another destiny. Does that mean I have nothing to do with it? Because man, if that's the case, I kind of lose hope in having any say in my, my future. Whether I try hard or not try hard, whether I sin or I'm an obedient servant of God, in any case, what you're saying is that it's all in God's hands. He can replace one destiny with another the way He wants. Is that true or not? That is where the second principle that He wants to discuss comes into the picture. Where He says, the second principle, and this is a very important one, brothers and sisters, very important. The second principle regarding Bada is that acts of supreme power and authority issue from, from God and when he brings about the replacement of one destiny for another it is not without wisdom and rectitude okay so God is gonna replace them with wisdom well where what does that have to do with some of these changes of destiny are brought about by man himself this is important that we understand I'm the one who chooses the path God is the one that now will lay down that destiny as a result of the path that I've chosen. He will lay it down for me. That's how, to, that's how we're supposed to look at it. Some of these changes of destiny are His decisions and His way of life. Lay, excuse me. Some of these changes of destiny are brought about by man himself who can, through his free will, his decisions and his way of life, lay the groundwork for a change in his destiny. So this idea of it was meant to be, or I don't know, it's um, the, if God decrees something, there's no way out of it. I don't know. Somehow we justify our mistakes, and our and, and sometimes we even want to alleviate the pain and suffering we might be going through because of the situation we're in. In all these cases, we put it on God. It's true that yes, God is at the top of the chain of causes and effects. But at the same time, we have to understand that we play a role in all of this as well. And sometimes others might pay, play a role in it as well. The fact that I die in a certain way, for example, because someone decides to pull a gun on me, has that, that means my fate also was in the hands of others as well. So mankind can play a, uh, can play a role in uh, the destiny and fate of themselves or others. What's important is though, Allah wants to see the reaction we have as a result of what happens and befalls us. A person who loses their life because someone else oppressed them, this is not acceptable. That person needs to resist and all that. But if they lose their life, Allah will reward accordingly and will be more lenient towards that person as our hadiths will tell us because that person was lo lo lost their life in an oppressed way and fashion. So, um, what the point that he's trying I think is very important and these two principles have really come together is that yes on one hand God has all the knowledge and all the power but at the same time we play a role I play a role in my own destiny and fate and even sometimes others might play a role 
in my destiny and fate. We have to understand, because right here people might say, well that goes against free will. I don't have a choice if someone else wants to pull a gun on me, God forbid. True, that's true, but we have to understand the free will that is necessary for creation is the free will that I have towards my own actions. The decisions I make have to be based on free will for Allah to be able to reward or punish me, punish me accordingly. But we have to understand, other than my own actions and the free will that I have when it comes to my own actions, everything else is out of my control. You know, whether or not an earthquake happens, a tornado happens, yeah, a blizzard happens, a person pulls a gun on me, a person runs over me, God forbid, all these things, these are all, there's no free will in there for me. God has put me in this world, which is a world of matter, which is a world of material. And so things will clash. Problems will arise. Suffering might take place. God wants to see what our reaction based on our free will is going to be towards all these things that happen to us. So we have to understand, because this is something that I've noticed younger people sometimes bring up, that, hey, what free will? I have no say in almost anything that happens around me. Stuff happens to me, it's not my choice. True, but that's not what constitutes free will in a theological or Islamic theological uh, context. In an is Islamic theological context, free will equals I have to be able to make my decisions on my own. And if I'm forced to make decisions that I don't want to, there will be no responsibility there Islamically. God will not hold me responsible if I'm forced to eat something haram to save my life, to preserve my life, and so on and so forth. Other hundreds of examples you can think of, right? So we have to understand this. That free will only has to do with our actions. The rest, yeah, we're, we're, that's what the material world is all about. But having said all of that, he says, some of these changes of destiny can have, to do, have something to do sometimes with my actions as well, my decisions. So for example, he says, let us suppose, for example, that a, man, that a person does not accomplish his duties towards his parents. Naturally, this shortcoming is improper and will have a detrimental impact upon his destiny. Brothers and sisters, this is just an example, okay? I don't want us to think that now every time we, are, we don't fulfill our duties to our, towards our parents, we can await a shortness in our lives or something. God cuts out a year from our life. But it is sometimes possible that this plays a role. It says, now if he, could, if he should repent of his actions and there, thereafter diligently perform all of his responsibilities, he lays the foundations for a change in his destiny, opening himself to the grace expressed in the verse, God effaces whatever he wishes and establishes whatever he wishes. Sometimes certain things will play a role. Um, sometimes certain things that we do, certain good actions and bad actions, do, we do play a role um, in our destiny. For example, the night of Qadr. People get together they have a'mal nights, nights of a'mal, nights of du'a, nights of uh, invoking Allah. And yes, a person might change their, their direction of their life, the direction of their life on one of these uh, holy nights. And as a result of that, God forgives them. And so a person that was doomed is now um, looking, is look, is looking good and can have all the hope in their life. Why? Because they've changed the course of their life. Right? These things all can play a role. I do dua, oh Allah, you know, uh, lengthen my life, give me health. All right, the way I was moving, the way I was, things were going, I might have, you know, fallen ill in a couple of years. But as a result of my dua again and again, it's put off for a while. I give charity in the way of God. I give sadaqa. All these things can play a role. I go and visit my blood relatives because we have hadiths for these things that these things can add to your life, visiting your blood re relatives, or uh, maintaining ties, let's call it, with your blood relatives. All of these things can play a role in one's destiny and fate, okay? So, on one hand, Allah is all-powerful. He can replace one destiny with another. But when is He going to do that? When certain things take place. Just like that uh, Choose Your Adventure storybook that I talked about. There are 40 destinies you can choose from, but you're the one who's supposed to choose it. But who wrote it? Who wrote the book? Someone else wrote the book. The author of the book wrote the book. I'm the one who chooses which path to take, 
And as a result, that destiny that has been written as a result of that path that I choose and decide on is, uh, is what I am subject to or made subject to. All right. The question here we have is, brother is saying, how else can you phrase this instead of Allah wants to see our reaction given his foreknowledge? Okay, so that's a, <laughs> that's a good point. You're getting philosophical here. And so if I try to answer that right now, um, it'll take a lot of time. Uh, but in a nutshell, let me try to keep it as uh, concise as I can. If I would phrase it in another way that would be philosophically correct and not say Allah wants to see our reaction given His foreknowledge, um, I would say it like this. I would explain it like this, that look, God's foreknowledge as a matter of fact is not foreknowledge in him, when it comes to Him. Okay? Foreknowledge means knowledge of something to come. Yeah, something you have knowledge of something before it has come and happened, right? It seems that this is not the case with Allah. With Allah, His knowledge of things that even are going to happen in the future are like His knowledge of things that happened in the past because He's not governed by time. He's not bound by time. So something that I've done in the past for Him, He has knowledge of it because it took place in the past. And He will have knowledge of something that I've done in the future because I've already done it in the future in His eyes. And so He will have knowledge of it. So yes, this sentence saying that Allah wants to see our reaction, this is an inaccurate statement philosophically, but we have no other choice but to use words that we can relate to, you know. So we have to word them in this way, we have no other choice. But yeah, Allah in reality brought us here so that we react to things the way we're supposed to and make the right decisions towards things, right? And He has knowledge of which paths we are going to take with our own free will. And so that's why he has knowledge of them, because for him, we've already done it, because he's not bound by time. That's all I can say right now. Uh, I don't want to complicate it even more. Alright, hopefully that answers your question to an extent. Alright, so moving on. He says, look, I want to give you some examples and proof that, look, we play a role in our own fate. This idea of you know, whoever God has decreed for you will marry you, for example. I hear this about marriages all the time. Yeah. And so the person doesn't try. The person is fearful to say no to somebody or to say yes to somebody. All of these things because they are afraid that they're going to be going against the decree of God. Right? And so this causes confusion for people. And sometimes even it causes weakness in people's faith and not giving God benefit of the doubt anymore. Because they're like, okay, God is the one decreeing, right? No, 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 no. God decrees what you do, what you choose. What, so in other words, you're supposed to try your best, figure things out in a certain given situation, right? And then put your trust in Allah and say, oh Allah, help me out in this situation. This is what I've decided. This is what I've decided. Give me your barakah. Give, put your magical touch on this as well. I don't like to call it magical touch. I'm just saying it for lack of better terms. Alright? There is no such thing as magical touch of God. Okay? But yeah, just I'm just saying that so that you get what I'm trying to say. Alright. He says, the first example that I'm going to give you. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ This famous verse, Surah Ra'ad, verse 11. It says, Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in, which has to do with themselves. In other words, people, do your part, Allah will do His part. It's not about sitting back and saying, okay, Allah is the one who's doing, decree, Allah is the one who's decreeing, so we'll just let Him decree. That's not how it works. No, no, you're supposed to live. If someone looks at you from outside, they might not even think you believe in a God because the way you're doing work the way you're acting seems like everything's in your hands that's what it should look like but you have to understand that Allah's at the top and He's the one who's going to actually implement that which you do He's going to make sure that what you do goes through now if I'm going to like if I'm going to work hard study hard all these things I do the natural outcome is that I'll be successful so even a person who doesn't believe in God is going to become successful. 
The question is, what's the difference between that person and the person that's a believer and is working hard and is successful? The difference is up here. The difference is in their perspective. That look, one of them is doing it thinking they're the only one who is determining their faith. The other one says, I'm doing my part, Allah's going to do his part. Yeah, so there's a big difference in perspective. But when you look at them from the outside, they look like they're doing the same thing. Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. These people, when you look at them, they are doing hard work because Allah has told them in the Quran, "I won't change you. You have to change yourself, and that's when I will allow change to happen for you." Uh, I think this is very key in the way we see things and how much work we put into things. I've seen both sides. Some people, they go so far that they think it's just them. They're believers in God. But practically, it seems that they feel it's just them. Everything is in their hands. And slowly, it's as if they're independent of God's decree. No, no, no. Do your part. Allah's decree is also going to come. Usually, it is the same as what you have determined as your own faith through what you're doing. Uh, excuse me. What you're, uh, I keep saying faith instead of fate. Usually... What God has decreed for you is what you have determined of your own fate through what you're doing. Alright? So that's one. One verse. Another one he says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبُوا فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Surah A'raf verse 96. If the people of the towns had believed and kept from evil, surely we would have opened for them blessings from the sky and from the earth. But they denied. And so we seized them on account of what they used to do and earn. What they used to earn, meaning what they would do and what they would get as a result of what they were doing. This also is a verse that's very clear in how Things are, and fates and destinies are in the hands of the people. It says, look, if people have faith, those people that we would send punishment towards, if they would had faith, or we sent prophets to, if they had embraced, then what we would have done was open up the doors of the skies and the earth to them and blessings would just shower down on them. In other words, if they had done that, that would have happened, but they didn't do that, so the exact opposite happened to them. Well, that means that their fate and destiny was in their own hands. They just didn't do what they were supposed to do. And so God's not going to do anything other than what they're asking for. In other words, in their actions show that they're asking for blessings. So Allah gives them blessings. If their actions show that they want punishment, Allah gives punishment. That is the destiny you choose for yourself. But who's the one giving it to me? Who wrote out this 40 destiny script, Allah wrote it up. But I'm the one who chooses whichever one it is and Allah is the one who will give me what I'm asking for. This is very, very important to understand. I think it's the middle ground. As I said, I've seen both extremes. Some will be so busy in this dunya in a way, when you open up their hearts, you find it's all what I do. It's all what I do. That's the only thing that's going to get me anywhere. No, no, put Allah there too. The other extreme, you see it as well. Some people... They will slack off, not take life serious. The guy is married, he's not working pro- going to work properly. No. Um, in Farsi we say, as shuma harikat, as khuda barikat. You do the movement, you, do, you get a move on and get off your back. Harikat means to move. Allah will give barakah. Allah will give that quote unquote magical touch that I said. Which as I said before, it's just for lack of better terminology. All right. Number three, he says, as suyuti which is from the Sunni school, is very famous. He says, in his Quranic commentary, that Imam Ali asked the Prophet ﷺ to explain the verse, يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتُ وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ The verse that says, Allah effaces anything He wishes and establishes anything He wishes. You know of of decree and what uh, of fate and destiny. Then Imam Ali asked the Prophet about this. The Prophet responded, "I shall enlighten your vision, and that of my ummah with the explanation of this verse. Giving alms in the path of God, 
being virtuous towards one's father and mother, performing pious acts. Such deeds transform misfortune into good fortune, prolongs one's life, and prevent a bad death. Have you noticed some people die in a very bad way? Sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes that's a result of certain bad actions they might have had in this life. They might have, been, for example, someone was destined to die on January 14th, 2018. And they happened to die on that day. And then the thing is that because of certain things that they've done, they have a bad death on that day. If they didn't have those bad actions, it might have been a good death on that day. All of these things, it's very hard to you know try to gauge these things try to codify and figure out and and make it you know in a way that you can figure it out exactly you know how it works it's very hard we don't know all the variables all we know is a lot of things play a role i better do my part at least in that which plays a role in my destiny and that is to try to do good acts in this explanation that the holy prophet gave imam ali salam he makes it clear to him that certain good acts will yield certain good results. Namely, here, prolonging one's life, preventing a bad death, and changing misfortune to, to fortune. Yeah. So this idea, I've heard some scholars say this, this idea of if you're a good person, then, you know, you can make sure that God's going to send you harder tests and life is going to be hard for you. That is maybe true to an extent, and uh, we do have some hadiths like that. But at the same time, the Quran is saying, and other hadiths are also saying, that if a person does things the way they're supposed to, it will open the doors to better things as well for them. So that's something to keep in mind. Another example he gives is <clears throat> a hadith by Imam al Baqir where he says, Imam al-Baqir said, respecting the ties of kinship and you know maintaining blood re re relationships purifies one's acts and bestows blessings upon one's wealth. It also protects one against adversi ad adversity, renders one's final reckoning easy, you know, yamul hisab and pushes far further away <clears throat> one's death. Wow. So out of all of these, most of them, if not all of them, have to do with this life that there are some things that have an effect on this life for us and, and, and our destiny and fate in this life. <clears throat> Once again, I do have to emphasize, brothers and sisters, if someone is struggling with something and suffering with something, doesn't necessarily mean that now they've done some bad actions to deserve this. There, as I said, there's a lot of there are a lot of variables in this whole thing. What I need to do is do my part, the rest is, is in Allah's hands. The rest is in His hands. So he says, taking these two principles into account, what were they? Once again, God has power, knowledge, and all that, and all that stuff. One. And he can, he, re, he can replace one destiny with another destiny. So that's first principle. Second principle though, is that if He's going to ever do that, it's going to be based on, it's going to be based on wisdom and rectitude. And so it's not just, you know, random. And so this all sometimes even has to do with how we do things, how what decisions we make in life that God will replace one destiny with another. I, gave, I did dua for something. I gave sataqa. I was good to my parents. You know, I called that uncle or aunt of mine that I have been, haven't been speaking to for years. Things like that. Yes. So he will change our destiny based on these things. Because that's wisdom. He says, taking these two principles into account, it is clear that the concept of bada'ah pertains to an evident aspect of Islamic belief. Leaving aside the question of the expression of the term itself, all the schools of Islam are at one in accepting that meaning to which the term refers. Okay, so we have a term called bada'ah. Bada'ah refers to all of what we talked about so far. And destiny is changing. <coughs> destiny is changing, and God's decree, yes, um, varying from one situation to another. Now, the problem. Let's go to the problem. The main problem. If no one has an issue with what we just talked about, which according to Ayatollah Subhani, no one does really. 
then why is it that some people call the Shia school out for adhering to this notion? Answer is the word and the term that is used to refer to this notion is problematic, he says. Now, problematic, and he doesn't say it like that, but some find it to be problematic. Why? He explains why. Finally, he says, in order to clarify, yeah, I'm going to just finish this article. I thought we'd have time for the next one, but no, we'll wrap up after this last discussion about the terminology and why this name is used for this concept. Finally, in order to clarify why this Islamic belief is expressed by the term Bada'ullah. Yeah? Or Bada Lillah. Yeah, they've, uh, the translation didn't do it right. Bada Lillah, it says here. Why this is referred to as Bada? We offer the following two points for consideration. Those who employ this term follow the Prophet's usage of it, he says. It's not like we just made up a term. We believe that this is something that the Prophet has used. What is that? He says, Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari, relates in his book that the Prophet said. Okay, so someone, a Shia who might be watching this might say, why are we using Sahih Bukhari if that's not one of the reliable sources of the Shia school? Just like Al-Kafi is not a reliable source in the Sunni school. The answer is, I think, very clear. That because usually the ones who uh, will find a problem with the title that is used for this concept are from the Sunni school. Uh, whether they're theologians or just lay people, then it is, all, it is just befitting that you know we cite the hadith from this source that they accept and agree on. So he says here, so it's for argument, argument's sake that he says, Bukhari relates in his Sahih that the Prophet said, in regard to three persons suffering from the diseases of, now here it says, let me look it up real quick. I don't know what this is. It says, the, the hadith says that if the Prophet said, if, three, if people are suffering from three diseases, I don't know what they are, so I'm not going to read them. He says, in regard to three persons suffering from three diseases, God Almighty has brought about these diseases in order to try them thereby. Then he related in detail the story of their lives and showed how it was that God, on account of their denial of his blessings, removed from two, from two of these persons their previous good health and inflicted upon them diseases of their forefathers. Yes. What is the wording that's used in Arabic? All right. The wording that's used in the Arabic version of this hadith is Bada lillahi ayyabtaliyahum. There were three people. There were three people that suffered from diseases. The Holy Prophet speaks about them or some of them. And he says the reason why they were healthy but then they fell ill was because Bada Lillahi Ayyabtaliyahum. It became clear to Allah that it's now time to uh, inflict them with something, to punish them, or maybe to try them. Ibtila means to either test and try. Or it means to just straight up punish. So the word that's used is bada lillahi. The verb bada, which comes from the infinitive bada, with the hamza at the end, that's what's used in the hadith. So Ayatullah Subhanahu says, don't blame me. I get this word from this hadith, for example. That's one example he gives. This kind of usage also, he says, derives from the linguistic principle of resemblance and from con conventional modes of speech in the language of the Arabs. It is customary for a person to say in Arabic when he changes his mind about something, Bada li. It became apparent to me. That is, it has changed for me in my mind. My mind has changed. Religious leaders wishing to speak the kind of language that will be understood by those to whom their speech is addressed have used this expression in connection with God. Alright, so he says, look, it is a kind of if we put aside those hadiths we said uh, that 
the verb has been used for God, then uh, what we have to say is that, if we put those aside, what we have to say is that these scholars and theologians who use this term, they're using it because this is what people use in, nor in their normal day-to-day -day, day -day, day -day talk and jargon. That's just how they say it, you know. Oh, I changed my mind. Yeah, or else we all know God doesn't change His mind. Now someone might say, well, how dare you speak about God like this? This is God we're talking about. He's like, oh, hold your horses, man. Hold your horses. There are verses in the Qur'an where God uses certain verbs to describe Himself or His actions and decisions. And some might say, whoa, if the Qur'an hadn't said it like this, we wouldn't have said it. Yes? A few examples. It says, for example, Surah Tariq, يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا which means, they plot a plot and I plot a plot. The Allah says about certain people who plot against Allah and His Prophet and Islam, <laughs> Allah says, I'm plotting too. Is God really plotting? No, of course He's not plotting. God has knowledge of the, of the past, present, future and, and everything. He doesn't need to plot. Or, you know, it might, it might imply malice. God doesn't have any malice in Him. Alright, so that's one. It's just because this is just the wording that's used in, in such situations. God is using it for Himself as well. وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا وَمَكَرْنَا مَكْرًا Surah Naml So they plotted a plot, we plotted a plot. Once again, makr is, has kind of like, you know, it means to conspire and plot against something or somebody. You know, it kind of is a negative thing. It implies malice. Well, is that, is that something that God is uh, subject to? No, of course not. Surah Nisa, Inna al munafiqin yukhadi'oon Allah wa huwa khadi'ohum. This one's interesting. Lo, the hypocrites seek to deceive God, but it is He who deceives them. So God all of a sudden now is a deceiver. No, it's just, that's how, that's just what the situation is calling for of verbs to be used. Yeah, the context. Nasullah fa nasihum. This is the worst of them. Nasullah fa nasihum. They forgot God, so God forgot them. Does God forget? Does God ever not have knowledge of something? No. So forget here is being used metaphorically. When the verse of the Qur'an says, God's hand is on their hands. God doesn't have a hand. All of this is metaphorical. So when we say bada, it means a change of course. The cha a change in the course of things. Yeah, and so they'll say, oh, you're, trying, you're saying God changed his mind. God can't change his mind. God is all wise, all powerful, all, all knowledgeable, all that kind of stuff. Yes, just using it in layman's terms. So this is just layman's terms so that things aren't overcomplicated. So he says, in any case, the scholars of the Shi'i school, taking note of the impossibility of alteration in the knowledge of God, have carried out extensive research into the use of the term bada, which we cannot summarize here. Students wishing to investigate the matter in detail should refer to the books noted below. So he has a footnote there where he talks about it. Oh, in short, in short, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is devoid of all these limitations. And so if a, a term is used and might have certain restrictions and limitations to it, we are using that concept for God, stripped of its limitations and restrictions. Yes, this happens every now and then. Allah uses that in the Qur'an as well sometimes for Himself, just because He wants to keep things in layman's terms. Next week we have the discussion of Raj'ah, which is a, a very Shi'i concept, <laughs> I'll say. And... Until Subhani brings a verse of the Qur'an he wants to talk about to show that it's, it's in the Qur'an. We'll talk about that a little bit and whether or not we feel that that's set in stone or not. And if we can move on after that, we will have another discussion as well, which is a very controversial and touchy one. Um, and we want to see how our scholars approach that concept and keep the respect and are careful not to provoke and hurt anyone's feelings. And that is the concept, of, uh, this, the topic of Adalat al-Sahaba, yes, and the companions of the Prophet. Is it true that the Shia don't respect them and so on and so forth? That's something we need to talk about as well. We'll just go by what he teaches, inshallah, next week. Thank you for tuning in. Take keep us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.